Hi, good day and welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about something called server sent event. What I want to show you today is how you can use something like server sent event as another way of making API calls to our backend to get data and to get updates. Now, in our previous example, we were calling a RESTful endpoint to get the total number of users. If you look at my screen right now, you'll see that I have, let's pretend this is my web application that I've changed a bit, and this is my dashboard. If you don't know about anything about an admin dashboard or a dashboard, don't worry, I'll show you some examples just now. But let's just imagine this is my dashboard, and just like how we had total number of users where every time we create a user, we wanna see the total number of users get updated. But in our last example, in web application two, part two, for example, when you post a user, that's only when you get an update. If someone else was using our application and they created some users, we wouldn't see it until we either refresh the screen or also create a user. That's not good. What we want to be able to do is sit back and watch our screen and have a live dashboard. And as you can see, the numbers on my screens are changing. And I'm not using a plugin in my browser to keep querying. As you can see, if you look at the refresh button here or reload button, you see it, so it's not getting called. So these events are just getting pushed to my application and I'm updating the screen. So how might you write something like this? Or Rather, why might you want something like this? So let's go take a look at an admin, an admin dashboard, for example, for admin dashboards. And I'm go to images here. And so you can click on any one of these if you like. And so here's an example of an admin dashboard. You can have charts and graphs and so on, right? For example, here you have total users, percentage for the last week, average time, and so on. And you could imagine that so you, you, your dashboard presents not only users, but how many inventory items you have in your inventory if you're using a, if you're doing a store application for example how long users are spending on your website which page it, pages they're hitting the most and so on a whole number of things which region of the country or the world they're coming from if you put a map on there right? but again the idea is that you want to have a live dashboard it's something that as you were looking at it these charts and graphs are changing based on data that's happening on activities that users and others are performing on your website and based on how what data you have in your database charts and how pretty it looks, you can get libraries for that. The important thing is I want to be able to get the data. And that's what I'm demonstrating is how you can get the data pushed to your application, your client, and then on the client, they display it appropriately. So enough talking, let me show you how to do this. So what I'm using, like I said, is something called server sent event. So what is server sent event? It's, a, it's relatively new as in maybe 10, 12 years old, but only now people are sort of taking note of it, way of um, getting events from the server. And you can go look at examples, different places. So probably one place to start is W3C School and two, and it shows you which browsers support it. Um, of course, some of the major browsers ex except Internet Explorer from Microsoft, but essentially your Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Opera. So uh, good support across the board. Another place you can find a little bit more details on server sent event. I found uh, that the Mozilla website, so Mozilla website, has good bit of details and goes into different ways in which you can do multiple events and so on. So, and the different types of events. So definitely check out their documentation for a little, little bit more details and the, some of the capabilities that you get gain from being able to do this. So I'm here on my console and uh, we're going to do, they don't want it that way, but instead, uh, I don't want a nested directory. Okay, so this is it. All right, so let's do m here ls. Okay, so this is this is exactly what I want. Okay, so the first thing I want to do, if you look at our example so far, we register a handle to return a file and so on, and now that's as good. But no, we want to have this server sent event. So for now, to simplify things, just so we can focus on server sent event. I'm going to remove the code for our user API, okay? And instead, just say that I'm going to register a handler for server sent event, which I'm going to call server sent slash dashboard. So this is where I'm going to get all the data for when I make a, a send a request to this endpoint where I'm going to get information for my dashboard. So I'm not going to be using this right now. So let's take that out. And I don't need this. All right, so now all I need to do is write the handler. So let's do that. All 
And that seems to be fine. The only other thing I need to do to write a server sent handler, if you remember when we look at the examples, um, the server side, you need to set these, you need to set at least these two headers, which is telling the client not to cache the data, because of course you're going to keep sending more data, so it shouldn't cache what you get now. And also you want to tell it the type of data. And notice you said it's text forward slash event that stream. This is very different than when we used to say text forward slash or application forward slash JSON, for example, right? So we're telling it that oh, the type of data we send in Mac is an event stream. And the browser is know what to do when it sees that this is the type of data. And we'll see that in a minute. So let's uh, just put this in as our, the two headers that we have to set. Another one that is good to set that you see in different documentation is keep alive, uh, connection to keep alive, which is basically telling the client to keep the connection alive. So I've done some testing with both keep with and without keep alive, and it works just fine. So um, I don't know on the worst situation, you would need keep alive. But if, for example, you notice that oh, your client is not getting up, is updating for a bit, and then afterward doesn't seem to get any update, it might be because the connection just eventually time out. And so you might want to then go back and in your server side code, set keep alive. So definitely do a lot of testing um, before you put this into production or something. Okay, so now we've set our, our set our errors that we're going to be sending back to the client. Now we want to write some data. So let's have a counter that every time our handler is called, we can send a new value. So one way we do this is by, of course, writing some data to the client. So, okay, so a few notes here. Remember, if you look at the documentation and the examples, you must if you want to send data, must specify it by using, you know, data colon and then space followed by your data. There are other things you can send. You can send something like, for example, if you send this, it means essentially I'm just giving you an update, refreshing the connection, but this is nothing. You can throw this away. It's like a comment. And um, as, there are other ways, things you can send also. So definitely look at the documentation. For now, we're just talking about sending data. We need a counter variable. So every time my analyst call, I'll increment count and then send it. We should probably print this out on the screen also. Okay, so we're definitely going to write that out to the console so we can do some debugging. Oh, handle func. There we go. So here, I do not need two of these. But if what I notice in my testing, if you do not send two new line character, like if you just try to send this alone, your data, it doesn't update. For some reason, the client sees this as an error. It gets the message, but it sees it as an error. So definitely do the back shot, two new line characters. Another thing you'll see in the documentation, it says that you must call flush. I notice with Go, you don't have to do an explicit flush. You're also going to find an example where people wrap the writer in a flusher and then call flush explicitly, but it works just fine without doing an explicit flush. So essentially, this is all we have to do. Um, notice the only two things that really change, or three things that we change, is we prepend our data with this data colon space, we put two new lines character, and we send these headers. So those are the only three things that we really had to change. We would have to set, well, if we really want to do this properly, when we were writing JSON data, we would usually have set it to application JSON anyway uh, to differentiate that from, let's say, we were sent returning HTML. So that's nothing new. We just set the type of data. And so setting headers is nothing. All right. So that's all we need for the backend. Believe it or not, that's all we need. So we have a RESTful endpoint that our client is going to query, and we set this thing, and um, we write a handler this way. Okay. Let's go look at our client. So we already had a client and basically what it was doing is it essentially we wanted to update this user count variable. So I'm going to create a new variable, which I'm going to call counter. And I want to see that get updated instead. So let's go to our JavaScript and Let's go back here. One of the things we know is for our body unloaded, we call get users. And this was because we wanted to go query the backend to get the current number of users, but we're not going to be doing that now. So let's change this to unloaded. So we're going to write this new function and I'm going to get rid of all this stuff about users because we don't really don't need to post a new user or anything like that. All we're doing is reading from the backend. Okay, so I'm going to leave my menu and so on. So again, I simplify things. All I have is this counter with this ID, and I have changed my function that I'm going to load to unload it. In JavaScript, again, I don't need all of this. So let's 
get rid of this and all I need is a function called unloading. So what do I need in this function? Well, again, looking at the documentation, you create a new event or a new event source rather, calling this new event source object, and you tell it the endpoint you want to talk to, and then you would register the listener. So let's do that. Now I have a variable called event source. I'm going to attach a handler for when new messages arrive. And you can see you can use add event listener, or you can do stuff like on message, on error sorry, on message, on open when the connection opens. Basically, these three messages are what you're going to be focusing on. You can set handler for it on error, on message, and on open. So I'm going to use on message. And if you want, you can examine that event object. So I'll just log that if you want, but up to you. Um, but really, what I want to do is this event, uh, because I noticed already on when you play with it, you'll see it out there's a data field and a data property. And that data property is which going to contain the value. The value is what I want to set here on counter. Eventually it on the event, when this function is called, this on message function is called, it will look up the HTML element and then assign to its inner HTML event that data, the data for that event. That's all I care about. And oh, this is function. This is not go. So that's it. Again, all we've done is really very minimalistic code on the back end. And this doesn't look very different from what we were doing before. And for JavaScript, that's really the biggest change in my opinion. Instead of using Ajax, we know using the Ajax object, we know using this event source object. And with the Ajax object, we can only request, wait for something to come back. And we set a handler when that request, the server respond. No, we're going to be able to have this stream of events. So let's run our code and see. Okay, so I have something else running on that port. So let me kill that. The example I showed earlier. So now our code is running. Example code is running. And notice from our output, we can already see that our API is getting called multiple times. Now notice in our JavaScript, we do not call this more than once. We call this once only when the page is loaded and that's it. Well, that's because I already had this application going. So it's calling the same API on front end. So let me refresh it. And you can see when we refresh our JavaScript or our application, you can see because it was already making some calls before that counter was going up. So that's the thing when I, even though I stopped my backend, the client was still running on that other example that I had. So it was just still trying to reach the backend. And as soon as my, I started the backend, it started making calls. But there you go. There's my front end being updated. There's no refresh or anything happening in the browser. This is all taken care of by that new API that are in browsers now called event source. So I don't have to think about it. Now it looks like it's updating about once every second or so, but actually it's more like three seconds. Now remember, you can actually push multiple events. You don't have to, uh, you could push events when you want. So when your backend has data to push, it can just send it anytime. So we're not going to spend time doing that, but definitely look up how you can do that. It's pretty much straightforward. Whenever you have data, just send it. That's a simple example of how we think. So let's expand that a little bit to see how we might create a dashboard. Let's say I want to have a dashboard. And so what I want to be able to send is not just one counter value, but maybe a JSON object. Now we know in Go how to do it very easily. We would use a struct and have it encoded as a JSON string. So let's imagine that I'm writing a, the application I have is some kind of store where I have items that I sell and I want to see on my dashboard, the current inventory, you know, how many items are available, the current price and so on. And also I want to see how many users are on my store. So let's sort of mock up some data and types represent that. So now I have some types that I can use. So for example, I created a, because of my, I'm dealing with currency, I might want a new type to represent that. And I haven't expanded it with method yet, but you can imagine that I, I had some methods appropriate for currency handling. But I have this currency type, I have an item, and items usually would have a name, quantity, and price. But instead, for my store, since I'm going to index it with the name of the item, I decide to just use a map. And so I don't put the name in the item itself because we can get that from the map. But if we wanted to, we can also add that to the map and have the way we index it be different from the name that we display. So we can certainly do things like that. And the other thing is, well, actually, you know what? Let's just do that. And then for my store, well, my store is just really a collection of items. And you could choose whether you want to put this in a slice 
or a map. Like I said, I'm going to use a map so I could know which thing I'm pulling out, but you can simply make it a slice and just iterate over the list. And then for my dashboard, it's all the things that I want to send to the dashboard. So user information, inventory in my database, and I might have some other types that I can create for other things and just put them all within the dashboard object here, um, dashboard structure. And so when I encode, I will be sending to my front end a snapshot and of course, there are a number of other ways that you can do this, right? You might decide that you want to have multiple um, APIs. So not only one front API called dashboard, but maybe an API for users. Because remember, once you call those functions uh, and you create an event source, it's going to always be querying your backend. So you can have multiple of these. Um, so it's up to you however you want to do it. I'm just showing the example where I make one call. I have one endpoint that presents all the information for my dashboard. But you do not have to do it that way. Okay. Uh, so I just want to keep this example simple. So let's move ahead. So let me write some additional code that initializes an object for our uh, our dashboard. Essentially, what I want is each time the dashboard handler is called, I send a new snapshot of what the dashboard should look like. So let me write an update function that sort of just mimics and change the values which in the that we're going to be sending to the front end. So okay, so I sped up a little bit. So I went over the types already, and in my main, I simply create a channel and call a go routine to call update da update dashboard. The handler simply grabs an event from the channel, which is a dashboard event, and send it to the dashboard. The update dashboard handler up creates a dashboard event, put it on the channel, and send it over. Now, we can see that oh, my old code is running, so let's run the new code. And you can see that because I use a buffer, and I try to write the buffer directly from my front end, well, it's actually sending the bytes of the buffer. So I have to go back and modify the code so that no, I don't just send the bytes to the buffer, but I actually say buffer to string, essentially call the string, not to string, but rather the string method. And then once I send that, now you can see it all, I'm sending a JSON object to the front end. Now I just update the front end. So I have it display, you know, bicycle prices, book prices, and so on. So I'm going to speed up past this because basically it's just decoding that string that's going to come into a JSON object and then now putting it on our UI in the way that we see fit. Now, again, you can use charts and, you know, gauges and all this other thing, but I'm just showing you that all we can send this information, we can get it, we can decode it, and I'm displaying it on the screen. Now, once you have all this going, you can easily, once you just have the basic going, you can easily extend it. For example, let's say I actually wanted to do a graph. That's easy. I just go back to my data type and I can add, for example, a slice for integer to represent some numeric chart, or I can add slice of float to represent some other chart that has floating point numbers. And now once I have that, I just all my encoding is already being taken care of. So that's going to go over without any problem. So I, once I have the inf infrastructure in place, I could just build on that. And I rerun my compile, rerun the code, and you can see that what happened? We get in the encoded new, we get in two new encoded uh, fields, chart one and chart two. Of course, if I want it to look different or I want it to look more like a low case JSON object, I can see how my JSON encoding should be done by um, adding JSON struct fields to them. Um, but that's it. It's really that simple once you get the basics of it. And I think this is really, really cool. The server sent event is very, very nice. Okay. All the code that I've written for this example is on the GitHub page, and you can find the link for the GitHub um, repository in the description below. Okay. Take care. Have a great rest of the day. See you in the next video.